Okie. All right. So uh, what do we have on our agenda? We have a reminder of the Hackfests. We have a discussion around the cello community. And it's actually, it's a, it's a broader conversation, I think, that we should have, which is um, because I think the cello issue is resolved. But I do think we want to talk about um, the whole notion of, um, uh, you know, private back channel um, uh, discussion groups and so forth. Um, uh, we have uh, an FYI. I don't know if Makoto-san is on the call, but I think uh, there's been a yeah, uh, I'm here. few emails that um, Aroha would like to seek approval to graduate. And so I think they're proposing to propose is where that is. And then um, <clears throat> Dave would like to have a discussion on uh, CII badge certification requirements for uh, graduation and uh, for the various projects that we have. Are there any other agenda items? Good, Makoto, we'll, we'll, we'll tee you up third in the agenda. Okay, I guess we can get started. So Todd, you wanna bring us up to date on the Hackfest? And I guess it would be interesting to know how many people have registered or are planning to register. Yep, certainly. So uh, Hackfest is confirmed June 19th and 20th in Beijing. This is co-located co with uh, LC3, which is essentially the LinuxCon Beijing event. Uh, right now, there are 15 people registered, uh, which is pretty typical uh, this far out. Uh, but if you are planning to attend, please get registered as soon as possible, just so uh, we can plan accord accordingly. And then, as always, we have a draft agenda. I don't think much is in there as of this point, but um, any topics you want to see get covered, uh, please get those slotted in ASAP. And, and I want to add, so we've decided, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Todd, <laughs> uh, we've decided to pass on the hackathon at this time. Um, I, we, uh, I, it turns out Beijing is about as expensive as New York uh, when it comes to spaces uh, that would be suitable for this thing right now. Um, and, uh, and, and as well, it felt like, you know, there wasn't as much kind of momentum going into that as, as we would have liked, especially for this more ambitious idea of making it very focused on crawling inside the code. Um, but it was also partly influenced by the realization that we have room at the Hackfest for 200 people. I, uh, I mean, just again, this is the nature of the size that we're able to find and the location, which was uh, co-located with the uh, with the, the Linux conference. So um, we have a tremendous amount of room, and we could really focus on using the Hackfest uh, for the kinds of kind of high level. Uh, I mean, kind of, I'm sorry, deep dive kind of conversations that we typically have. But we could also use it for uh, bringing a lot of new contributors into the system, helping them understand, you know, how the how the community works, how the how the code works, and so. Um, I'm, what I'm hoping that we can do is focus our promotional energy and focus our, our kind of uh, conversational energy at the Hackfest on, on really bringing new devs in and getting them you know, up to speed on how to be contributors to the different projects uh, and, and, and spread that knowledge about how the projects work, that sort of thing. And so I still strongly encourage uh, people to travel if they can, because I think it will be a really intense and, and, and fun event. Um, uh, what I'd also like to see, if possible, if there are some particularly maintainers of projects who, even if you can't travel, could commit to being online and accessible during this time, uh, or even during your ordinary you know, <laughs> work and waking hours, but still in those two days, to help answer questions to help uh, if new you know, pull requests come up or you know, kind of deeper dive kinds of questions that um, ordinarily being in person would help uh, answer. It'd be really great to have, uh, to know that there might be some, some quicker response to, to those questions than, than typical for a Monday, Tuesday kind of thing. So, um, so that's it. So feel, uh, feel free as well, even if you can't make it, to suggest ideas for the agenda uh, that uh, you think folks might Find, uh, find interesting to talk about. And that's it. Any questions? Okay, if not, I guess we can move on. Does anybody have any questions or, and, and actually, I mean, maybe if we just go around the horn and, you know, if we can get, you know, people to, indicate in the chat if they are thinking of going. I, I just like to get a sense for how many people are thinking, attending. 
I, this is David from Hitachi. I'm not online, so I can't do the chat, but we are sending, uh, we're working through the approvals, but we'll be sending two people. Okay, great. All right, I guess we can move on to the next topic of conversation. I don't know, Brian, do you want to tee this up? Maybe best. I, I would. I would. I mean, I, I um, was uh, offline for a lot of yesterday, or at least uh, uh, swimming around in the uh, OSCON uh, uh, conference uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of circuit. So I wasn't able to participate as directly, but getting caught up on it overnight, I was really happy to see the community not only have a frank and honest conversation about it, but also converge on a solution. Um, and in particular, I want to thank uh, uh, Arno. For really stepping in and 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 trying to navigate the issue and understand and, and articulate what what the right solution might be for Bawa for uh, um, kind of acknowledging kind of where where the the um, where the problem lay and being willing to uh, correct it and for everyone else for contributing positively to the conversation um, uh, the 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 one of the more challenging or well, might, some might even say poisonous things that can happen in an open source community is a sense that the real conversation is happening somewhere else right um, even if that's not the case or even if uh, what happens in side channels or private conversations is not decisional in nature um, the sense that you know FOMO <laughs> fear of missing out <laughs> uh, is a is a real um, uh, psychological uh, toxin um, and so what's really important in in these communities to help is to help people understand where is the real conversation taking place and where uh, what what are the fewest channels one has to follow to be able to be a part of the governance of a project and so um, we've supported um, the China community in being able to use the tools that are more convenient for them uh, as a means to help onboard new developers to help answer basic questions the structure of the technical working group China is such that it's designed to be how do we get the local community there really fired up and 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 competent uh, about these technologies and and get them to the point of being contributors on the premise that as they um, come up with patches as they come up with ideas those get brought over to the main community right through our standard channels for really what you'd call the decisional type of conversations and then implementation work and so, you know, having having a side channel related to uh, Cello on WeChat, not a problem at all if the focus and the committed uh, focus for that and, and people really adhere to this is uh, about bringing new developers in. Um, but anytime those conversations evolve to, hey, we ought to do this, or maybe we could make it easier if it did that, or let's add this feature, those should be brought to the more formal channels, to WeChat, to, to I'm sorry, to, uh, to Rocket Chat, to the mailing list, to JIRA, and then eventually into, obviously, the code uh, repository. So I think if we keep that in mind, that, that will serve as a guide for navigating these kinds of issues in the future. Um, and I do also think even these unofficial side channels, when they're about convenience, also need to be open, also need to be accessible, in even, even to observers. Um, and I think we still need to figure out what, what kind of drove that concern about um, lurkers on the channel, because I think, you know, and I'll end with this, the, um, every community has a power law dynamic. You know, typically one-tenth of the participants um, in any uh, online community will actually be active contributors, and the other 90% are observing, are waiting. Um, sometimes they're learning, uh, trying to figure out how to contribute. Um, sometimes they're just users who want to maintain an ambient awareness of what's going on on the project so they can plan accordingly. Um, and that isn't a problem at all. There's no extra cost to having additional members on the mailing list, and there shouldn't be to having extra members on a chat. Um, and so I think that's also an ethic that we need to make sure um, is permeated in all of the official or even unofficial channels that are involved with development. So I'll try to write this up in an email to the to the to the list to which this issue was posted. Um, but I um, again just want to thank the community really for stepping in um, and and finding a way to finding a path out of the, the situation. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> yeah, I. I wholeheartedly agree with all of that. I just would also though like to just reinforce, <clears throat> you know, that I think in Rocket Chat, we've had Rye going in and, and um, you know, uh, at least, uh, you know, when he catches that there's a private channel um, uh, to try and, and, um, and fix that. But 
Um, we, I think we all just need to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, the, you know, what, what Brian was saying that we, we really do want to be completely open and transparent in all shapes and forms. And, ha you know, having lurkers is actually, it, it, it's, it's, it's been a thing for as long as there's been, you know, open source projects uh, out on, on the internet. And, um, uh, and it's, 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 it's sort of, it's a fact of life. People like to sort of lurk and just follow what's going on. They aren't necessarily participating, but that's, that's okay. That's, it's perfectly normal. Um, uh, not everybody is, um, you know, eager to, to get out and, uh, and so we have a lot of wallflowers in, in open source. It's just the nature of things. But, uh, you know, uh, the more that we can keep everything completely open, transparent, do everything out in the open, the better off we'll all be. Any other comments or no? Hi, uh, this is Victor. Uh, I, I want to say uh, thank, thanks, Arnold, for help solving the problem and uh, make the WeChat channel open is one thing, but I think there are other things about openness. Uh, for uh, Because uh, whether the WeChat channel is open or not, it's decided by only one person. Uh, it's not uh, a pattern of democracy. So I think, uh, and I have already gave some advice uh, on the uh, mailing list, uh, and I suggested uh, to transfer the ownership of the WeChat channel uh, to uh, Linux Foundation representatives. And uh, I think uh, developers can gather together and yeah, having I'm private uh, and having uh, private uh, discussion channels. But uh, development uh, progress should be uh, going public. Uh, it's not suitable to discussing uh, the development thing in a private channel, uh, especially as it's established by the project lead and using the same name as uh, the project. So it's hard to say it's uh, private or public because decisions are made there. So we've, we've uh, looked at having the um, ownership. There is a, an, an official Hyperledger WeChat channel um, that uh, uh, we're, we've looked at trying to get the ownership of that channel transferred to a role account. And there's complexity because role accounts are limited to organizations that are official organizations operating in China, um, as I understand it. And so it's one of the things we're trying to figure out how to do with our footprint in China and with our community that's uh, 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 kind of our staff that are based in uh, Hong Kong. So I think that might have been left as a forgotten to do, and I'll, I'll try to follow up on that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, but, but catching up on all of the, you know, project specific channels that might emerge um, might be a challenge. Uh, and so so I think I think I, I do want to focus on getting the ethic right and the morals right in the community. Uh, and, and uh, you know, and then we can talk about kind of ownership and control kind of as a result of that. Uh, as an after after effect. Uh, hi, this is Howard. So uh, I'm the guy that <laughs> sent the email. Um, so I I I, I think uh, the WeChat group uh, need to be fixed. Uh, that's going uh, without saying. Uh, but I I want to echo uh, Victor's comment is that uh, the actual solution I was looking forward to. Uh, get from the hyperledger community is to establish uh, formal procedures uh, that put this check and balance of you know power of either the, the project lead or the core reviewers in place so that um, for example open set community uh, has been very like insisting on they have these four open principles so the TC of OpenStack will regularly check all the official projects, so check their diversity, um, check their uh, compliance with openness. So I think this is like one one of the uh, aspects that uh, we could improve upon. Another thing is uh, we we need to have uh, 
for example, in the TS charter, uh, if we have one, to uh, to 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 formalize, uh, for example, what is the procedure to promote uh, from a contributor to a core reviewer? What is the procedure to remove a uh, core reviewer from the uh, from his position? <coughs> So it, it cannot be done just by the grace of the project lead, you know. So the the whole thing, uh, I wasn't actually complain uh, complain about whether the WeChat group is official or whether or not. I was mainly concerning uh, the 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 way of managing uh, projects, the way of how we operating as a uh, at least a normal open source project. Okay. Thanks, Howard. So, in fact, some well, okay. So, so we we've sort of shied away from initially, you know, actually to this point, from dictating any policy with regards to how you manage a given. Uh, one of the umbrella projects, you know, like Fabric or Sawtooth or Aroha or whatever, and basically left the governance of that project up to the project team itself. Um, and so we haven't imposed overarching um, policy regarding to what you call your committers or maintainers or whatever, um, and how they're promoted, demoted, and handled. We could. Um, I guess the concern has been because many of these projects are being brought in um, from the outside and they're already in some cases established that um, uh, forcing uh, an established project to change its process um, is not necessarily conducive to bringing more into the fold. Um, I do think though that your point on having sort of a, a periodic review of the processes and so forth is um, actually a good one <clears throat> and maybe there can be just some uh, some sort of objective criteria that could be measured to determine whether or not the policy is reasonable um, uh, but uh, I think you know we collectively would have to come up with something that isn't necessarily stipulating a process so much as um, something that we could all agree that we could use to assess whether a policy for how you manage com committers or maintainers or whatever is in place. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. This should be a, a, a process. So um, I think, for example, like reopen the WeChat group uh, will not address the issue uh, entirely. Uh, it might be a good uh, first step, but we have to like follow the, follow a long process that gradually establishing this governance uh, model and you know everyone should feel like safe and um, just 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 being happy ledger should be no difference being in other open source communities uh, another thing I want to emphasize is that it is okay on the technical side that the project lead uh, present this you know kind of dominant force uh, I, I think it's uh, it's a common practice uh, in order to improve the efficiency of the development, and I, I think these are all okay. Uh, it's uh, just the non-technical uh, part of it, uh, the non-technical part of job of a PTL. Uh, the, this is what at least I think need to work on. I think we can probably continue a lot of this over email, um, but I, I, I agree that I, I, having having some documentation, having some some of the basic guidelines, and 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 figuring out what do we actually want to standardize across projects when it comes to developer uh, culture and developer, you know, the path from being a um, you know, basic contributor to a core uh, maintainer, right? Um, uh, putting putting that into paper, having minimum viable process, I think, uh, is important. Not having too many rules because then it's easy to forget one or two, and and inconsistent implementation is worse than no implementation. Um, so let's let's figure out progressively how to get there. And the great news is we have 20 years of the open source 
other open source communities figuring out what works and doesn't work that we can draw from uh, to do this kind of thing. So uh, I, I agree with that and, and think we can start we can start the process of figuring out what what's the right what do we want all projects to follow to make sure that they are transparent and accessible and that the processes are fair too. So thank you for for raising all these issues. Yeah, and if I may add just one thing, I mean, this is Arno speaking. It, you know, it seems like a lot of this is due to the fact that there is a big percentage of the people involved in this project that are actually new to open source and they don't necessarily understand what's expected. I hope, you know, uh, as we go through these pains, eventually people will learn and improve. I, I have no doubt you know people like in this case Bauer is well intended and he will you know he was happy to have a chat with me and learn and I'm sure he'll do better next time but I think what's important is even you know no matter how hard we try to develop the process uh, there will always be cases where you know people have dispute over what's the interpretation of the process or whatnot and so I can only encourage again people to step up sooner rather than later don't let things start getting annoying in the way and and you know start building resentment or something and then slam the door and just quietly go away uh, i really i'm sure it's you know this is true for other tsc members they, we are very open to you coming if you have any doubts whatsoever at any point in time about how things are taking place and you know reach out to us i'm happy to help for sure And, and uh, this is Leonard, uh, the morning of one. And that's a very good same thing that Brian, um, Christopher, and yourself, Barney, have just said. Um, yes, I agree, we do need governance because the level of maturity we now have in pipe ledger is such that we can equate ourselves to any large corporation out there trying to um, produce stuff. Stuff meaning product services improve and enhance on existing products and services, which is what we are doing. Although you might say the the component, the um, applications come from outside, but we're there to provide standards and improve so we can have um, robust systems for our industries. That having been said, it means we need to have the right level of um, process, um, procedures, all of that's part of governance. And yeah, so this is an issue we now need to look at and see if we can improve our our uh, governance process to make it um, a happy and enjoyable, I might say, um, project uh, for our different teams based on their cultural environment. Because sometimes that can play a part in how decisions are made and how we address it. So it's that sensitivity we need to bring to every project based on its merits. And I think everyone has said we agree. I've just seen that the document that um, um, I think it's you, Brian, who posted on, on process. So maybe we can look and see how we can tweak it a little more in favor for that particular project um, out in China. And we can all be happy campers going forward, but it's a learning process. And I'm happy that the gentleman brought it to our attention and we can look to it um, to address it in a very favorable manner for all concerned. So, thanks. Okay. Next up is, um, unless there's anybody else that wants to chime in, uh, the next up, there they are, <clears throat> is the, uh, uh, Bakosa san uh, wanted to um, bring forward a proposal. Uh, should I talk? Um, yeah. Can everyone okay. hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, sorry I don't always stay up late, uh, but actually the time changed, so this uh, meeting is now at a more reasonable time. Uh, I guess uh, daylight savings time or something changed in the States. Uh, so uh, we're working on the proposal uh, for uh, promoting uh, Iroha to uh, active status. Uh, so I'm going to send that out into the mailing list uh, in a day or so. Um, so just to, to keep an eye out for it. So uh, we've made a lot of progress on the core system and uh, we're about to merge uh, version 1.0 uh, beta into master. But um, Besides that, the community has grown quite a lot, I think. Um, a lot of people are in Japan, but uh, out of 24, uh, well, out of all the contributors to Iroha, we have uh, 24 people uh, at our company and 28 outside the company. So I think uh, we're getting closer to um, reaching critical mass of uh, people where uh, 
our company is not uh, required for the project to continue. Um, and also, especially the National Bank of Cambodia has been uh, very helpful and supportive, and uh, they're working on uh, helping to develop the project. So uh, even uh, if you know if, if our company Solar Mitsu went away, uh, the project should continue um, even without us. So because of that, I think uh, we should uh, have a serious discussion about uh, you know can we promote the project active <coughs> and. Uh, you know what kind of steps uh, should be taken or any uh, thoughts or opinions on that um, so anyone have any uh, rough opinion uh, before I actually send out the official proposal I can jump in and say that as the security maven I'm pretty happy with how Aroha has been running um, their branching model seems pretty great and the, the way the community has been working is excellent my only complaint would be that you still heavily rely on Telegram um, for a lot of your communication. And, you know, pointing back to what we were talking about earlier about communication channels being more publicly accessible, um, I would encourage that you try to push all of your team members away from Telegram and over onto Rocket Chat and the mailing list. That's, that's my only uh, feedback on that. Uh, thanks, thanks, David. Um, so one comment about uh, Telegram. So I was going to actually say something about it uh, just in the previous discussion, but um, I didn't want to, you know, kind of uh, lead everyone to, to a different topic. But um, <clears throat> yeah, th we uh, we don't like uh, keep people out of the chats, uh, but we kind of have fragmentation in some of the chats with respect to that between Rocket Chat and Gitter and Telegram. Uh, a lot of it are the same people. Uh, and some of the people are in all, th all three of the different places, but um, it's not really convenient. Um, we still manage issues and things like that on GitHub, but uh, it'd be really great if we could, uh, you know, build uh, a bridge between the different um, uh, platforms. So there's a message forwarding apps, for example, from Rocket Chat to Telegram and to Slack, uh, different places like that. Uh, yeah, some of our <laughs> some people like to use Slack as well. Um, I'm not. Uh, I, we don't do too much with, with that though. Um, but with the forwarding apps, there's one error I was having with uh, respect to the Rocket Chat setup the Linux Foundation uses because uh, logins rely on a Linux Foundation ID. Uh, it's it's it seems to not work. Uh, so there's some kind of bug or something. So I was wondering if it wouldn't be possible to get some kind of support from Raya or someone to uh, help with a message, message uh, forwarding. Um, I think the problem with message forwarding between different systems is that it's fragile uh, and it'll break silently um, uh, when it breaks. It could could break silently when it breaks. Um, I think a better approach is to decide that one of them is the decisional uh, channel and that the others are about support and help. And I mean, even there, it helps to have everything in one, uh, frankly. But um, if it's about, if it's really because of, you know, network blocks, for example, um, which is a big reason why in China it's hard to use the tools the rest of the world can use, um, then you you have to do that. But if it's about one developer likes the UI of one tool slightly better than another, um, though that's a less compelling reason to, to divide the community because it's really hard to keep up with three messaging systems, right? Four messaging systems for any one developer. And so the risk of fragmentation of the community is is something to really be you know, uh, cautious about, right, is to really try to fight hard against it. And I think that means just trying to pick one um, and letting the others be secondary, um, but but not as, not as trying to integrate them all together because they, because they have different UIs, that's why bridges tend not to work well when I've seen them, even between like IRC and Slack, which should <laughs> work well, um, in reality, it's really painful. Um, and even between the two tools that are most alike. Uh, that's a fair comment. Uh, to be honest, though, uh, I, I think some forwarding is better than nothing. Um, I don't know. We can try to push people some more, but uh, I've already asked people several times to go towards uh, Rocket Chat, but uh, it's hard to uh, motivate people to to switch. Um, if you have any ideas how to motivate people, uh, let me know.
But the community could pick one that's different from Rocket Chat if it had the same accessible, you know, properties as Rocket Chat has. You know, the same ability to search history, the same ability to uh, for anybody to be able to join, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, we're also supporting uh, side channels when uh, language is an issue as well, right? You know, you want to allow people to support each other in, a, in their local language if that's their preferred um, and and clearer kind of language, but but. You know, if you wanted to pick Gitter as your decisional, you know, chat channel, then um, that might not be a problem if it if it meets these other kind of community requirements. But um, I, I, you know, I do think that's part of the leadership of a project is picking one and uh, you know cajoling <laughs> the outliers to to get on board with that one. Okay, yeah, that's a fair enough comment. So, uh, yeah, that's something that uh, I think we can continue to move forward. Um, at least we try to keep all the uh, issues and uh, things like that on, uh, on GitHub as much as possible. And uh, things like uh, design and documentation on the GitHub wiki. Uh, for kind of pre preliminary design and things like that, we actually use uh, some things like Confluence, but uh, that's actually completely open and we don't, uh, uh, require users to log in to see the contents, but um, that's kind of just like a scratch pad. Uh, anyway, any other comments? No. <clears throat> so uh, we're looking forward to it. Thanks, Makoto san. Okay, thanks. So uh, yeah, I'll try to finish writing this uh, and uh, kind of. Uh, clean up some of the documentation we have on our side as well and uh, send that up. Okay, excellent. Thank Actually, you. One, one quick question. Where would we see the list of contributors? Would we see that all on the GitHub activity? Uh, yeah, do you mean maintainers.md or? No, I just, so, when I looked at GitHub, I think it said something like 15 contributors. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's on one project. Um, so. Yeah, it, that's another thing we should discuss maybe is, you know, how should we discuss, uh, you know, what the contribution is. So not everyone has actually uh, you know, pushed code, but uh, some of the people have uh, participated in either design or testing. Um, so the people who actually are unique individuals pushing code, that's all visible on GitHub on the various projects. So I can uh, try to uh, tally those numbers as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, next up is Dave, who's going to raise the bar on you, Makoto san. <laughs> hey, okay, yep. I, sorry, I was unmuting. Yeah, so I'm bringing a proposal this morning um, or today to talk about including the core infrastructure initiative criteria, getting the badge as part of the graduation process from um, incubation to full um, development status. Either that or make it a criteria for a 1.0 release. I really don't care, but I think that we, I, I think there's a consensus around the idea of everybody, all the projects in their hyperledger getting their CII badge. Um, I just want to decide that we are going to make that a requirement first and if if people are okay with that then we just need to decide when it, it should be a requirement um, the second part as i said i don't really care when that happens obviously earlier would be better than later um, but i just want to push hard for um, adopting this as a standard at some point i would like to see all hyperledger teams getting it um, it puts into place a lot of key uh, elements um, from a security standpoint that I think are important for our uh, all of our projects to to earn the trust of their users and, and to have a, a certain degree of integrity that we were seeking. So, um, does anybody have any comments on that? No, no comments. <laughs> well, then, it, 
the one comment that I sent in an email was basically, I just thought that the sentence that said something to the effect that um, you, you wouldn't publish a JIRA item because it would make the security issue public. And I know you and I have chatted about this. I think what you're trying to say is that we wouldn't have a publicly accessible JIRA item. I think yeah. you know, want to be tracking it in JIRA, but as a um, restricted access item, right? That That's correct, yeah. So um, JIRA has this notion of security um, permissions or security assignment. I guess I, I don't remember the exact word it uses, but I, I have another email thread that I've already start up, started up on it. I did the research. What happens is you create a security policy or security whatever attribute on JIRA, and then when a new bug is filed, um, if it's a security bug, the person who's filing it needs to needs to assign the security level to, you know, this is a security bug, right? By doing so, that will keep it private. Even though it's in our publicly accessible uh, JIRA, um, nobody will be able to see it except for the members of the security triage group. Is that an acceptable answer to your uh, concern? No, it, it is. I'm just saying that I, I just think it might be worth clarifying that. In the oh, yeah, yes. I will definitely um, make the updates to the proposal. I sent it out to the TSC mailing list like late last night, um, I'm probably going to make another pass on it today because because of this feedback. Um, yeah, um, that we we can have both, right? We can have them filed in our public Jira, and we can keep them private until they're resolved yeah. and and ready to disclose. So right, that that that's the only point I was. I, everything else I thought was fine. Yeah, and and to answer the questions in chat, people saying, "Didn't we already have this uh, discussion?" Yes, I believe we did talk about this, um, but I don't think it was formally um, added to the criteria for the a project lifespan, right? Um, I think we just all agreed, yes, everybody's going to get the CII badge. I want to just make it explicit that if you're going from incubation to full project that you need to get your CII badge or, you know, if you're going to your 1.0, you need to have your CII badge in place. So. I'm just trying to make this explicit. Dave, could you speak to Hart's question about why one keeps security bugs private? Um, and it's not just for active releases, it's, it's for different reasons. Yeah, so um, the reason why you would keep a, a security bug private is because um, A, it takes time to, to figure out what the correct solution is, and B, you want to be able to uh, if it's a particularly secure, well, I guess any security bug, you want to potentially go out to the existing install, installs, like the existing customers of the project, and to provide them a way to um, to patch, right? Basically, to get up and plug the security hole before it is known uh, publicly, because once it's disclosed, um, all kinds of hacking tools will adopt it, and they will start scanning and trying to exploit um, unpatched uh, installs of our software. So it, it's really just to keep our, um, keep our users ahead of, of being exploited, right? It's and, part of uh, what's called responsible disclosure, right? Yeah, and it's, it's also a very delicate thing. I mean, it's important. I mean, this is something every open source project does have to face is balancing transparency and balancing equal access uh, and not favoring um, a vendor over 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 other vendors, uh, with the need to manage the disclosure responsibly, so that the overall risk of the ecosystem is is main, is is you know kept as low as possible. So those who are on the security team have a very special obligation to um, make sure that they're not advantaging their own employer unfairly in, in this process. Well, part of my proposal for the um, security bug handling process was that um, as part of the CII badging thing, you, you, each team has to identify at least one engineer who's who's well versed in security development. And I'm proposing that those people, like at least one from each, at least one person from each team, would be part of this security triage team, and we would meet on a regular basis to go through reported issues and work them. 
right? Um, and, and to point, Brian's point, yes, we have to balance uh, the security uh, with transparency. And I think with responsible disclosure, the, the compromise is, yes, we will keep it private until there's a solution, but we will absolutely disclose it um, once there is a solution. And to answer Sheehan's uh, question, it, it's usually after a fix, right? Um, there's usually a commitment that we will address them in a timely manner. In fact, I think the core infrastructure initiative um, requirements state that a team has to demonstrate that they respond to security bugs within a certain amount of time. Um, when I've been advising the teams, I, I've said that you don't have to spell out X number of days, but you just need to spell out a policy that you, you are committed to dealing with them in a reasonable amount of time. Um, because we don't have any security bugs or haven't had any security bugs so far, um, we haven't been able to, to actually demonstrate it. So I've been just saying, let's have a policy in place for each of the teams, and then we will put this security bug triage group together, and then we will demonstrate the, that, uh, that requirement as the need arises, as we get security bugs. Um, we will get security bugs. It, that's just a given, and I want to have a place in it, uh, a system in place for us to handle this uh, in, in a publicly accessible way and, and in a responsible way. I think the other part of people reporting security bugs is that they normally give you some deadline, right? Because they want to keep you honest about you fixing that security bug. And if you don't fix it within whatever their deadline is, they will report it out to the public, right? Um, that's my understanding anyway. Yeah. Um, so the US CERT. Uh, group or actually the CERT group at Carnegie Mellon that's the computer emergency response team which I think also fed into the US CERT group um, they actually have a publicly stated policy of any vulnerabilities reported to them they will make a best a good faith effort to contact the developers um, but they do have a deadline of 45 days so they will sit on a report for 45 days before disclosing it um, you know considering that there's no mitigating uh, circumstances so if there's if it's being actively worked or if there's it's like a particularly egregious bug like could take down the DNS system or whatever they will not stay committed to that but they that's the the rough timeline that they have proposed is 45 days um, Let's see here. So the other question, is there a good example of a well-written open source security bug policy? If you look at the document that I put together, I have a bunch of references at the bottom, uh, links out to security bug policies for a number of groups, uh, Bitcoin, Apache, um, yeah, just a number of really well-run uh, open source projects. And I should say that I cribbed heavily from the Apache one, especially in the security bug handling thing. That's pretty much a copy and paste. Um, and I'm going to act, uh, give them attribution in the in the proposal um, because they're just rock solid. The way the Apache group handles um, security bugs is is probably the best in my opinion. They're really good at it. Let's see. Any other questions in chat? Um, yeah. Okay. So the documentation, the CII badge listed. Oh, so there, yes, Chris pointed that out. It's not easy to see what the criteria are until you look at the application itself. Um, I can post in links to the Fabric and the Sawtooth applications if you guys would like, or maybe Chris can for me because I'm on my phone. Yeah, um, or you know, anybody can just go in and you know, if you have a, a GitHub account, you can just do it on one of your own app, one of your own repos. Yeah, yeah. And that's the one thing I don't like about the CII page is it's not easy to look at the criteria until you're actually applying for it. <laughs> right. But they, I think, I think the intention there, though, Dave, is that they see it as a process that you would go back periodically and and yeah. revisit, and that they yeah, because you yeah you make a pass through it and you say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and then you can adjust it as you come into compliance. And then, uh, and then the other piece of it, I think I understood that it will be updated, and so you probably will have to go back and sort of revisit to address to refine. Yeah. Um, so to address Brian's question about security reporting for the GitHub issues based project, um, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, to be honest, I I will update the proposal 
today. Um, I know that we were talking about CII badge, and now we're talking about security bug process. But uh, yeah, I'll update. I'll update the proposal today for a solution for the GitHub issues based projects. I believe GitHub issues has a security flag, but I don't know that for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, we That's would like me. everybody to yeah, we would like everybody to move over to Jira if at, at all possible. But if that isn't possible, I will. I will address their systems and figure out a way for us to do it. Um, this may actually be a reason why you can't use GitHub issues, honestly, but I, I doubt it. I'm pretty sure GitHub has dealt with this many times before. Um, anyway, to get us back to the CII badge um, require, uh, proposal to, that that is a requirement to advance a project, um, is there any other questions related to that before I uh, ask Chris to put it to a vote? All right, silence is acceptance. <laughs> I'm no, gonna hand it back. So, hand so it back. <laughs> help me. In. You said you were gonna update the proposal. Are you saying we want to vote on the proposal now, or I'm gonna update the proposal. We'll do, can we tackle it next week at the TSC call next oh, week? Oh, certainly. Because... I just think that probably people would want to vote on the final proposal rather than that's what I'm saying. Proposal. What I'm what I'm calling for a vote for today is should we adopt the core infrastructure initiative badge? as a requirement to advance a project from, uh, say, incubation to full status or from full status to 1.0 status. OK, so let's just focus well, then on that one thing and, and have a discussion, because I, I suspect, and I know we talked about this in the past when we were reviewing the, um, uh, the, the life cycle uh, proposal. And so I think probably people would want to weigh in. So let's just sort of assume then that the question is, should CII badging uh, be a requirement to uh, advancing from incubator to active? And to answer Arno's question, active is just whatever is after incubation. <laughs> so Fabric and Sawtooth are active projects. But Aroha is asking today to be to to move forward. Well, actually, I think just right now Fabric is, but I know oh, that just Fabric is okay. Dan indicated at the Hackfest, and now Aroha uh, Makoto san indicated the interest. So I know that there are going to be some requests coming in real soon. Yes, and I want to agree with what Brian's saying here. Active is different from a software release of 1.0. Right. Act. Yeah. So we could we could make it a requirement at either stopping point. I just want to. I'm proposing that we make it a requirement. I don't care where, but I just want this to be something that all teams have to do before they get to the yay. We're at 1.0 and we're engaging with customers and and pushing for installs and all that stuff. Okay. So would it be applied retroactively? Yes. So it would be applied retroactively. I think um, Fabric is already in the process of going through their application. And Sawtooth is already uh, applying for CII badge, so um, yeah, the, the 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 two active projects are the one active project and the it, one about to be active apply project. It Sawtooth Lake. It applies only to Fabric at this point. Yeah, that's correct. Yes, and Fabric's already in the process of of getting it. So if we accept it as a requirement out of incubation, Fabric will catch up. They're already way ahead of the other teams anyway, on this this front. Let's see, what about projects that aren't really related to security, i.e. Explorer? Um, so this core infrastructure initiative badge is not focused on security. Security is just one of many sets of criteria. It's actually best practices for running open source software. So it includes all kinds of things like have a mailing list, have a web page, have a publicly accessible um, bug tracking tool, you know, it's about transparency and about being um, a well-run open source project. So I'm only focused on the security aspects of it, and that's how we got derailed on onto the security bug uh, proposal. Uh, but this, like I said, security is probably about 10% of the CII badge. Does that answer your question, Hart? So It does, thanks. 
I'd say if we're we're looking at this as it's solving technical problems, then the uh, the one o milestone might be more appropriate than the uh, um, incubated to active. Uh, but if we're looking at it as a uh, an aspect of the community's maturity, then you would probably apply that as a gate to going active. Yeah, I, I think it makes more sense um, putting it as a gate to going active because that would force a team to get all of the open sourcey bits in place. Right. Right. So I, I would just also, since I, I've just gone through it, and Dan, I know you just went through it as well, um, about 80% of the questions are automatically answered for you based on, you know, they do a little bit of introspection on your GitHub repo. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of that filled out. But I would say that there's probably 80% or even maybe a little bit more that just by virtue of the fact that we're a project in under the Hyperledger umbrella, as it were, um, that the Hyperledger you know, umbrella itself is providing for. So, you know, once Dave gets the security process in place, everybody gets that, right? Um, and, you know, the fact that we're, you know, either using Garrett and Jira means you have a review process in place. So there's an awful lot that we have that is just sort of the, 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 the blocking and tackling, if you will, for Hyperledger itself that you get to tick off yes, 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 yes. Um, or, you know, the met, 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 I should say. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it, it's not a high bar, to be perfectly honest, right? So uh, I, I, I don't want people to think that this is very intimidating. I know, Dan, I know you've just been through it yourself. So um, I don't know if you want to weigh in and sort of echo that. Um, yeah, I, I looked through the, I think there's a, a printed list of requirements. I'd, I'd have to dig up the link. Uh, but when I read through those, they weren't intimidating. Uh, I didn't actually go through the application process, but uh, Tom Barnes, uh, one of the Sawtooth contributors, did. Um, so I, I can't speak to the specifics of the application. Oh, okay. Wasn't sure who'd done it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I had a meeting with Tom yesterday to go through their application, and and um, it, it's not very onerous actually. Um, yeah. And actually, I should point out that there are the the, the number of the security items in the CII badge um, requirements are, there's like two or three of them that are blocked by the lack of a security bug process. And so that's why this is my top priority, um, both getting the CII badge requirement in place and getting a solid security um, bug handling process in place um, so that we can start having badged projects and doing all the right things around security bugs now that we're starting to move towards 1.0. So just to, to fill in, just to, this is Tom Barnes, just to fill in for what Dan said, I, I don't know is that as much as 80% of it is covered by processes, but certainly a great deal of it is covered by the, the umbrella processes that we're all, that we are all already following. Okay, uh, this is Vipin again. Um, well, just just want to ask a question. Whether uh, if if I'm, what I'm hearing is uh, right, which is uh, which is that this doesn't really uh, give you a you know a lot of coverage on the security aspect. So is this going to be uh, a reason for complacency because we have the CII badge in place that we should trust the software? Uh, I mean, what what is what is the feeling in the community around that? that particular aspect. Sorry, what was your question again, Vipin? I was, I, you cut out a little bit there and I'm trying to figure out what exactly you're asking. Okay, having the CII badge, as you have noted, is no, obviously not a guarantee for, uh, you know, not, obviously nothing is a guarantee for having a security bug. But if the process is light in security matters, uh, will it give us a uh, false sense of complacency when uh, getting the security badge to say, oh, now, I mean, the CII badge to say our uh, software is now secure. I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't go for the CII badge process, but I'm just uh, thinking yes. out loud. 
Okay, so the CII badge is not focused on security. It's focused on doing all the right things that our open source projects should do. Now, under that umbrella, there is some security pieces, and those will call, will point out to our security bug process. And yes, you're right, it does not give strict criteria of how to do a security bug process, which is why I'm putting in a process that is, is much more robust, right? And I'm looking towards um, other projects that have done this successfully for years uh, when designing ours. So yes, the CII badge is, I think it's important. I don't think it's gonna give us a false sense of security because um, it's really about doing all the right things as an open source project. Yeah, I'm not asking about the security bug process. I'm, I'm more, more interested in um, trying to figure out how uh, we can improve security as a whole by following uh, certain other uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, policy programming. You know, there are some approaches to improving security uh, which are not commonly uh, used. Uh, so maybe s some such uh, practices uh, should be made uh, either you know by you or somebody else uh, public so that the developers can uh, get information about that kind of uh, approach which strengthens the overall security of the system. Yes, so that is sort of the follow on after this. So we adopt the CII badging and we adopt the uh, security bug triage system next week or you know shortly thereafter. Um, I gave a series of slides on the CII badging program at the hackathon. And if you remember the last three or four slides were how to keep the security maven happy. And I went into pretty deep uh, detail on um, how we're going to do secure software releases, how we're going to do secure software development. Um, things like making the CI system enforce all of your policies and do static code analysis, making sure that we have dynamic code analysis at, you know, for each major release, which actually is part of the CII badge requirements. Um, looking into doing um, signed merges, signed commits, um, and then doing signed uh, releases so that the, the release, like the, the people installing it can verify its integrity, doing reproducible builds and things like that. I've already had meetings with Cloud Foundry and several other um, cloud distribution type tools to try to figure out what kind of integrity checking is built into those tools. Um, and I have a solution that is, is coming together. So, but I wanted to get these things lined up and knock them down in order. Um, I didn't want to confuse you with like a bunch of proposals all at once. <laughs> So yes, this is what, um, now, that, now that I'm focusing more on the security aspects of our software development and the way our teams work, um, you're gonna start seeing a lot of these proposals coming fast and, and furious. So we're, we're gonna tighten everything up, and it's not all based on the CII badging stuff, um, but the CII badging does require a, a good portion of it. And really, like to address what Marta is saying, um, I agree with Marta. It's really just giving reassurances that we're trying to do the right thing. This is this is us demonstrating integrity as as an organization to the internet, right, and to the, the people who are using the software. And uh, thankfully, we don't have to figure it all out ourselves. I mean, there's a lot of really great processes in place um, already with other very security sensitive open source projects. And I I'm very well versed in all of those because I was part of the one for Tor and the, the Tor browser um, uh, deployment system, which was the first project to ever use reproducible builds. Um, and we're, I'm also looking at things like Bitcoin Core and Ubuntu and all those and, and how they do um, uh, secure distribution, secure development and distribution. So um, just look for more, I guess. Like, sit tight. We're, we're going to. Uh, we're going to be tightening everything up. So, Dave, is it fair to say that the outcome of all your collaboration and um, 
uh, uh, sort of research work will be a um, security policy document of sorts that will tie everything together and make it clear and comprehensive to the Hyperledger Foundation project. Yes, Leonard. So the idea here is I think the, the action items or the output of all of this will be a series of blog posts and a published policy. Um, just describing, you know, the security processes in place at Hyperledger. I, I already have stubbed in blog posts on like the road to 1.0, which is going to talk about um, all of the things that our projects are doing uh, in the lead up to 1.0 um, to deserve the, the, the trust of the community. And then also pro um, posts on um, our CII badging requirement and our bug process system, you know, I'm going to be documenting all of this. It's all going into the wiki. I'm going to be publishing blog posts, um, working with our marketing group. And uh, yeah, ultimately running through the, the steering committee here to adopt um, policies that all the teams have to adhere to. Sounds wonderful. Thank you, Dave. Yep. Any other questions? So the first policy that we would be adopting is making CII badge a requirement. I'm on mute here. Any other concerns? Um, or maybe Todd, you can take a quick vote. Uh, oh, we try it. We pass. I, I think a few people have dropped, and we are not at quorum at this point. Um, no, all right. Let's let's pick it up then, yeah. Dave. Next week, maybe you can also have the the proposal. And we can take them up together. Great. Sounds good. All right, thanks, Dave, and thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Take care. Yeah, Bye. Thanks. Bye.